from Times Square in New York City, it's theCUBE, covering IBM's Change the Game, winning with AI, brought to you by IBM. Hi everybody, welcome back to The Big Apple. My name is Dave Vellante. We're here in the theater district at the Westin Hotel covering a special CUBE event. IBM's got a, got a big event uh, today and tonight. Uh, if we could pan here to this, 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 this pop-up, changing, change the game, winning with AI. So IBM has got an event here at the West End at tonight at Terminal 5, which is uh, right up the West Side Highway. Go to ibm.com slash win with AI. Uh, register, you can watch it online, or if you're in the city, come down and, and, and see us, we'll be there. Uh, IBM, a bunch of customers will be there. Uh, we had Rob Thomas on earlier, he's kind of the host of the event. IBM does these events periodically throughout the year, they gather customers, they put forth some thought leadership, talk about some hard news. So, we're very excited to have John Thomas here, he's the, the distinguished engineer and director of IBM Analytics, longtime Cube alum. Great to see you again, John. Same Thanks here, Dean. Great to have you. So, we just heard a great case study with Niagara Bottling around the data science elite team. That's something that you've been involved in and we're going to get into that, but give us the update since we last talked. What have you been up to? Sure, sure. So, uh, we're living and breathing data science these days. So, the, the data science elite team, we are a team of uh, practitioners. We actually uh, work collaboratively with clients. And this, I stress on the word collaboratively because we're not there to just go do some work for a client. We actually sit down, expect the client to put their team to work with our team, and we build AI solutions together, scoped use cases, but sort of, you know, expose them to expertise, uh, tools, techniques, and do this together, right? Um, and uh, we, uh, we've been very busy, I can tell you that. You know, it has uh, uh, been a lot of travel uh, around the world, um, a lot of interest in the program. Um, and um, engagements that bring us very interesting use cases. You know, use cases that you that would you would expect to see. Use cases that are hmm, I had not thought of a use case like that. You know, but it's it's been an interesting journey in the last uh, six uh, eight months now. And these are pretty small, agile teams. Sometimes yes. people use tiger teams. I mean, two to three pizza teams, right? Yeah. And my understanding is. You, you bring you know, some number of resources, let's call it you know, two, three data scientists, yes. and, and the customer matches that exactly. resource. Exactly. Right? That's exactly. the prerequisite. That right? is a prerequisite, because we, don't, we are not there to just do the work for the client. We want to do this in a collaborative fashion, right? So the customer's data science team is learning from us. We are working with them hand in hand to build a solution out. And that's got to resonate well with <laughs> customers. I mean, Absolutely. so often in the services business, it's like kind of customers will say, well, I don't want to have to keep going back to a company to get yeah. these services. Right. I right. want, teach me how to fish. And that's that is exactly, exactly right. I was going to use that phrase. That's exactly mm -hmm. what we do. That's exactly what we do. So at the end of the two or three month period, when IBM leaves, my team leaves, you know, the client, the customer knows what the tools are, what the techniques are, what to watch out for, you know, what are success criteria. They have a good, good handle of that. So we heard about the Niagara bottling use case, which was, was a pretty narrow, mm -hmm. how do we optimize the use of the plastic wrapping, save yes. some money there, but at the same time maintain stability. Yeah. A very, quite a narrow yes. use case. Yes. What are some of the other use cases? That yeah, that's seen? a very, uh, like you said, a narrow one, but you know, there are some use cases that span industries that cut across you know, different domains. I think I may have mentioned this on one of our previous discussions, Dave. Um, uh, you know, customer interactions. Trying to improve customer interactions is something that cuts across industry, right? Now, that can be across different channels. One of the most prominent channels is the call center. I think we have talked about this previously. You know, like, you know, I hate calling into a call center hey, because hey, don't. I don't know what kind of, what kind of uh, support I'm going to get. But what if you could equip the call center agents to provide consistent service to the caller and handle the calls in the best appropriate way? Reducing costs on the, on, on the business side because call handling is expensive. And eventually lead up to can I even avoid the call through insights on why the call is coming in in the first place. So this use case cuts across the industry. Any enterprise that has got a call center is doing this, right? So we are looking at can we apply machine learning techniques to understand dominant topics in the conversation. Once we understand, we, these have to be unsupervised techniques. Once we understand dominant topics in the conversation, can we drill into that and understand what are the intents and does the intent change as the conversation progress? So you know, you, you know, you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling someone. It starts off with pleasantries. It uh, then goes into weather, how are the kids doing? You know. Um, complain about life in general, but then you get to something of substance why the person was calling in the first place. 
And then you may think that is the intent of the conversation, but you find that as the conversation progresses, the intent might actually change. And can you understand that real time? Can you understand the reasons behind the call so that you could take proactive steps to maybe avoid the call coming in, in the first place? This use case, Dave, you know, we are seeing so much interest in this use case because call centers are a big cost to, to most enterprises. Let's double down on, on that because I want to understand this. So you're basically doing, <clears throat> so every time you call a call center, this call may be recorded you know, for <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. quality ser yeah. service. So you're recording the calls, maybe using NLP to transcribe those so, calls? So that's what, NLP is just the first step. Right. So, so you're absolutely right, now calls come in, there's already call recording systems in place. We're not getting into that space, right? right? So call recording systems record the voice calls. So off in an offline batch mode, you can take these millions of calls, pass it through a speech-to-text mechanism, which produces a text equivalent of the, of, the, of the voice recordings. Then what we do is we apply unsupervised machine learning and clustering and uh, topic modeling techniques against it to understand what are the dominant topics in these conversations. So you do kind of an entity extra extraction exactly, of those topics. Exactly, okay. exactly. Then we find what is the most relevant, what are, what are the relevant ones, what is the relevancy of topics in a particular conversation. That's not enough, that is just step mm. two, if you will. Then you have to, we build what is called an intent hierarchy. So this is, at topmost level will be, let's say, payments. The call is about payments. But what about payments, right? Is it an intent to make a late payment? or is the intent to avoid the payment or contest a payment? Or is the intent to structure a different payment mechanism? So can you get down to that level of detail? Then comes a further level of detail, which is the reason that is tied to this intent. What is the reason for a late payment? Is it a job loss, a job change? Is it because the, you know, they are just not happy with the, with the charges that have come in? What is the reason? And the reason can be pretty complex, right? It may not be in the immediate vicinity of the snippet of conversation itself. So you got to go find out what the reason is and see if you can match it to this particular intent. So multiple steps of the journey, and eventually what we want to do is, so we do all of this in an offline batch mode, and you're building a series of classifiers, <coughs> a set of classifiers, but eventually we want to get this to real-time action. So think of this, if you have Machine learning models, supervised models that can predict the intent, the reasons, et cetera, <clears throat> you can have them deployed, operationalize them, so that when a call comes in real time, you can stream it in real time, do the speech to text, you can do this, pass it to the supervised models that have been deployed and the model fires and comes back and says, this is the intent, take some action or guide the agent to take some action real time. Based on some automated discussion, right? So, so tell me what you're calling about, right? right? That kind of thing. Yeah, so, is that right? so it's probably even gone past. Tell me what you're calling about. So, it could be the conversation has begun to get into, you know, I'm going through a tough time. My spouse had a job change. You know, that is itself an indicator of some of the reasons. And can that be used to prompt the CSR ah. to take some action? Oh, it's okay. appropriate to the conversation. So I'm not talking to a machine at first, no, I'm talking no, to a human. Talk, this is just still and, talking and to a human. And real-time feedback exactly. to that human is a good, exactly. good example exactly. of human exactly. augmentation. Exactly. I wanted to go back in the process a little bit in terms of the model building. Yeah. Um, are, there, are there humans involved in calibrating the model? Absolutely, there has to be, there, there has to be. So, you know, um, for all the hype in the industry, yeah. you still yeah. need, uh, you, you know, what, what it is is you need expertise um, to look at what these models produce, right? Um, because if you think about it, um, machine learning algorithms don't by themselves have um, an understanding of the domain. They are, you know, either statistical or similar in nature. So somebody has to marry the statistical observations with the the domain expertise. Mm -hmm. So humans are definitely involved in the building of these models and training of these models. And, okay, and find, find so that's, so you got math, you got stats, you got some coding involved, yeah, and you got humans are the last mile absolutely. to really bring that, that expertise in. And then, in terms of operationalizing it, how does that actually get done? What's the tech behind that? Uh, the platform yeah, so it's a very good question, Dave. So, um, you know, the, if you build models, and what good are they if they stay inside your laptop? Mm -hmm. You know, they don't go anywhere. What you need to do is, I use the phrase, weave these models into your business processes and your applications, right? So you need a way to deploy these models. The models should be consumable from your business processes. You know, it could be a REST API call to the model. 
in some cases, or as API call was not sufficient, uh, the latency is too high. Maybe yeah. you've got to embed that model right into where your application is running. You know, you've got data on a mainframe. <coughs> Um, a credit card transaction comes in, and the authorization for the credit card is happening in a four millisecond window on the mainframe on old, uh, not old, but you know, CICS uh, COBOL code. I don't have the time to make a REST API call outside. I got to have the model execute in context with my CICS COBOL code in that memory space. Yeah, right. You know, so that's so. So the operationalizing is deploying, consuming these models, and then beyond that. How do the models behave over time? Because you can have the best programmer, the best data scientist build the absolute best model, which has got great accuracy, great performance today. Two weeks from now, performance is going to go down. Mm. How do I monitor that? How do I trigger alerts when I fall below a certain threshold? And can I have a system in place that retrains this model with new data as it comes in? So you got to understand where the data lives. Absolutely. Uh, you got to understand the the physics, yes. uh, the latencies involved. Yes. You've got to understand the economics. Yes. And there, there's also probably, in many industries, legal implications. Oh, yes. You know, yeah. Explainability of models. You know, uh, can I prove that there is no bias here? Right. You know, all of these are challenging, but you know, doable things. Right? So. What makes a successful engagement? Obviously, you guys are outcome driven, but, yeah. but talk about what, how you guys measure success. So, um, for our team right now, it is not about revenue, it's, not, it's purely about adoption. Does the client, does the customer see the value of what IBM brings to the table? This is not just tools and technology, by the way, it's also expertise, right? Mm. So this notion of expertise as a service, um, which is coupled with tools and technology to build a successful engagement. The way we measure success is, has the client, have we built out the use case in a way that is useful for the business? Two, does the client see value in going further with that? So this is, this is right now what we look at. It's not, you know, yes, of course, everybody has cared about revenue, but that is not our key metric. Now, in order to get there, though, what we have found, a little bit the hard way, is, uh, you know, you need different constituents of the customer to come together. So it's not just me sending a bunch of awesome Python programmers to, right. to the client. You know, it is from the, from the customer's side, we need involvement from their data science team. We talked about collaborating with them. We need involvement from their line of business because if the line of business doesn't care about the models being produced, you know, what good are they? Mm. And third, people don't usually think about it, we need IT to be part of the discussion. Not just part of the discussion, part of being the stakeholder. Yes, so, so you've got, so IBM has the chops to actually bring these constituents yeah. together. I have, have, have actually a fair amount of experience in herding cats in, in, <laughs> in, on large organizations. Yeah. A, and you know, the customer, you, you, they've got skin in the IBM game. This is a, to me a big differentiator between IBM, certainly some of the other technology suppliers who don't have the depth of services expertise and domain expertise. But on the flip side of that, differentiation from many of the SIs who have that level of global expertise, but they don't have the tech piece. Exactly. Now they would argue, well, we do anybody's tech, but yeah. you know, if you got tech, yeah. you know, you there's got to go yeah, together. bring those two together. Exactly. And that's really seems to me to be the big differentiator yes, for that, IBM. That, absolutely, Dave. Well, John, thanks so much for stopping by theCUBE and explaining sort of what you've been up to, the, the, the data science elite team, very exciting. Six to nine months in, yes, um, yeah. are you declaring success yet? Still too early? Ah, uh, well, we're declaring success and we are growing. You know, just, yeah. uh, just be, you know. Growth is good. <laughs> lot of, lot of attention. All right, this, great yes. to see you again, John. Absolutely. Thanks very Thank much. You, okay, keep it right there, everybody. You're watching theCUBE. We're here at the Westin in Midtown, and we'll be right back right after this short break. I'm Dave Vellante.